In the area around the university where I work, the city's put in a rapid bus transit system. It's a bus system with dedicated lanes for buses so they can bypass traffic. One day while riding to work, I noticed that the bus stops seemed really far apart. I was sure that the designers made a mistake and that the bus stops could have been closer. Then passengers would have shorter walks at the end of their trips, and even with a few more stops while they're on the bus, it would save them some time. When I got to work, I sat down, determined to prove that the engineers had made a mistake. In this video, we'll go through the modeling process to find the optimal spacing of bus stops. This is the third video in our mathematical modeling series. If you haven't watched the first two, you may want to go watch those first. The links to those are in the description below. These five steps are the way we have described the process of mathematical modeling, a process for solving real-world math problems that are more complex than straightforward computation. The first step is to pose a question. For this video, we're trying to find the optimal spacing of bus stops. At least the optimal spacing for bus stops along the path I drive to work. But the model we come up with could be adapted to other situations. The second step is to make assumptions and define variables. The first thing we need to define is what we mean by optimal spacing. I think a reasonable way to define optimal spacing is the spacing that minimizes the travel time for passengers. There are other considerations, cost for example. The engineers don't have unlimited funds, so there are some constraints. Let's start with our definition of optimal, the spacing that minimizes the travel time. And let's make some other assumptions about the situation. You may want to stop the video here and think about what quantities or features matter and what doesn't matter much for this situation. You may also think about assumptions that we can make that will make the situation simpler for us to consider, but still give us some insight into the problem. One simplifying assumption I'm going to make is that we're traveling on one path with no transfers. The stretch of the bus system that I drive by on my way to work connects two universities, Brigham Young University and Utah Valley University. They're about four and a half miles apart. I'm going to use that as the total distance someone is traveling in my model. One advantage of picking this distance and path is that we can compare our results to the actual number and spacing of bus stops. After all, I'm trying to prove that the engineers made a mistake. For any particular bus route, there are places where some people might not want to go on a route and other places, like a theater or shopping center, that would be a popular place to go. So it wouldn't make sense to put a stop in some locations and more sense to put a stop near others, but just to get started, I'm going to assume that any spot on the path is just as likely for people to go as any other. I'm also going to assume that the people taking the bus are equally distributed along the path. With these two assumptions, it makes sense to make the stops equally spaced. That might make the calculations easier and give engineers a starting distance between stops or a number of stops on a particular stretch of road. There are a lot of variables or values that might be important for us to consider. To start, I'm going to pick a reasonable value for any variable except the one we care about the most the spacing of bus stops. Here are some values I think are important. The distance a person walks to the bus stop and walks from the bus stop to their final destination at the other end of their journey. The pace someone walks, the speed of the bus, the length of time the bus stops at each stop to load and unload passengers, the distance from the first stop to the last stop, and the number of stops. The number of stops is connected to the spacing of the stops, but every other variable we can pick a reasonable value for. Already our thinking about variables gives us a hint about the model we want to develop. We want a function that takes in either the distance between stops, or alternatively the number of bus stops, and gives out the travel time. We need to decide whether to use the distance between stops or the number of stops as our input variable. We could do either, because it is a simple calculation to find one given the other. But I think the number of bus stops is easier to work with, so I'm going to use that variable in this video. Let's pick values for our other important factors. Let's say a passenger starts on the road that the buses take, but they're right in between two bus stops. This is an average case. Some passengers could be closer, but some could be well off the road and have to walk further. I'll assume a passenger walks three miles an hour. The bus drives an average of 30 miles an hour. The bus stops for 45 seconds on average at each bus stop. I'll also assume that there's no wait time for the passenger, so the bus is there when the passenger arrives. With these assumptions, we can start to build our model. That is step number three in the modeling process. Our model will be a function that uses the values we've assumed and our input variable of the number of bus stops, and the outcome is the time to complete the trip. The time it takes can be split up into three different categories, walking time, driving time, and stopped time. Let's start with walking time. The passenger needs to walk to the bus stop. The distance to the bus stop is half the distance between stops. Let's assume there are three stops in a diagram of this situation just to help us build our model. If there are three stops, and we place them so that half the distance between stops is at each end, then the situation looks like this. 
The total walked distance is the same as the distance between two adjacent stops. The three stops split the road into three equal pieces, two sections between the three stops and the walking distance of both ends. For n stops, the pattern will be the same. The walking distance will be equal to the distance between two stops, and that can be calculated by multiplying 1 over n times the total distance. So in our case, 4.5 divided by n. And since we want walking time, not walking distance, we divide the walking distance we just calculated by the walking rate. So 4.5 miles divided by n divided by 3 miles an hour. We will need to be careful about our units. We have miles divided by miles an hour, so we will get out time in hours. For stopping time, we take the number of stops and multiply it by our average stop time of 45 seconds per stop. This assumption is in seconds, but we calculated walking time in hours, so we need to convert this to hours. 45 seconds is equal to 1 80th of an hour, so stopping time will be 1 80th times n. For driving time, we can take the driving distance and divide by the driving rate, which we assume to be 30 miles an hour on average. The driving distance isn't all 4.5 miles. If we go back to our diagram, notice that the bus only travels between two stops before letting the passenger off. If we had four stops, the bus would drive three sections of the road. The other section is walked by the passenger. So our driving distance is 4.5 divided by n, all multiplied by n minus 1, or it can be arranged to be 4.5 minus 4.5 divided by n. Either one works. Now divide by 30 miles an hour to get the driving time in hours. Adding all of our times together gives us the total travel time. We will label our function t of n, t for time and for number of stops. Now we have a model to work with. Analyzing the model or solving the model, then interpreting it is the fourth step. Remember, we're looking to solve for the number of bus stops that minimizes the total travel time of all passengers. We can analyze this model in a few different ways. We could use a spreadsheet and calculate the times for a different number of bus stops and find which number of bus stops minimizes the travel time. We could also graph the function and look for a minimum. If you know calculus, we could take the derivative and set it equal to zero and solve for the n that minimizes that, that travel time. Graphing or derivation does assume a continuous input variable, which doesn't make sense in our context. There aren't partial bus stops. But we can still assume it's continuous to see what the optimal bus stop is, and then check the whole number of values on each side to find the optimal number of bus stops. The graphing approach gives us an optimal value of 10.39 bus stops and a time of 0.41 hours, or about 24 and a half minutes. We can't have a fractional bus stop, so I tested 10 and 11 in our model, and 10 went out, but barely 0.41 hours compared to 0.41023. So the same for all practical purposes, but not if you're the engineer. If you're the engineer, you'll go with 10 because it costs less money. How many stops are there between BYU and UVU? Well, here's a map of the bus system. Someone that wanted to go from BYU to UVU would probably walk to this BYU Stadium stop and get off at the only UVU stop. That is only six stops, a lot less than we came up with. See, I knew those engineers made a mistake. Well, let's not be so fast to criticize. We have ways of checking to see if our model's reasonable. We could check it against actual data, sending someone to take the trip and to time themselves. But there's another way. We could compare our model to Google's model. They have a model to estimate how long it takes to travel across town, walking, and taking the bus. What do they get? From BYU campus with a short walk to the bus stop, to UVU with a short walk on a campus, Google gives about 32 minutes. But that's with six stops and possibly accounting for some wait time for the bus to show up at the first stop. Our model with six stops says it should take 27 minutes. A little different, but if we add in a few minutes waiting for the bus, then we're pretty close. Google even gives drive time and walk time breakdowns. Our model says we should spend 15 minutes walking and 12 minutes riding the bus. Google gives 18 minutes walking and 14 minutes riding. We aren't too far off of Google's model, but maybe we could change our model so that we are closer to Google's. I noticed on my ride home last week that the UVX bus was going about as fast as I was, but I was hitting a lot of lights and I'm sure my average speed was less than 30 miles an hour. Maybe our average speed is too high. If we change the speed so the ride time of our model is 15 minutes, a speed of 21 miles on average, then we get a total amount of about 30 minutes, quite close to Google's. I found online that Google uses 2.8 miles an hour as walking speed. If we use that in our model, we get a travel time between 31 and 32 minutes. However, even with these changes, we still get 10 stops as the optimal number of bus stops for a 4.5 mile trip. If we look at the UVX map, we'll notice that there's a stretch going south from BYU to the south part of town. It is also about a 4.5 mile trip from the BYU South Campus stop to the last stop on the bus line. 
and there are 10 stops on that stretch. So why the difference? Well, part of the road from BYU to UVU is a mile-long stretch with no shops or homes on the road, so we wouldn't expect to have a stop there. And so the stops are really to accommodate the other 3.5 miles of the trip. This means we would need fewer stops for that stretch of road. Also notice that according to our model, the amount of time for travel across town doesn't change much whether you have seven stops or 16 stops. So there's a lot of flexibility for the engineers to adapt the number of stops to the particular needs for any stretch of road. This flexibility is one of the key findings from our model. So it doesn't look like the engineers made as big a mistake as I first thought. It also looks like we went through a very similar process to the Google engineers to program their travel time on Google Maps. We adapted our model that produced the same results as theirs for this stretch of road. We just used simple algebra and didn't need artificial intelligence. Of course, Google can modify times based on current traffic, which isn't in our model. Well, we have completed our math modeling process for this problem. And one thing I learned is that I should be a little more humble when I'm judging the decisions of others. Do you know of designs that engineers made that were very bad or very good? Put them in the comments. I once had a small folding knife in my keychain, but it liked to open up by itself and stab me. Why would someone design something like that? Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.